across America and around the world. This is Veterans Radio. This is Veterans Radio. Welcome to Veterans Radio. I am Jim Fossone. I'm the officer of the deck today. We've got some great programs for you. I think you'll find very interesting. We always want to remind you, you can find more about Veterans Radio at its Facebook site or at the web. VeteransRadio.org is our new URL, VeteransRadio.org. Where we're on the web 24-7, you can find a lot of our podcasts there as well. We post new ones every Tuesday, so you can get a new story, a new interview, something you didn't know before by going to veteransradio.org. And before we get started, we want to thank our sponsors. First up, we want to thank National Veteran Business Development Council, nvbdc.org. It was established to certify both service-disabled and veteran-owned businesses. You'll find out how they can help your business by going to nvbdc.org. We want to thank Legal Help for Veterans. Legal Help for Veterans fights for veterans' disability rights all across the nation. You can reach them at 800-693-4800 or on the web at LegalHelpForVeterans.com We want to welcome to Veterans Radio today, Navy veteran Jenna Carlton. Jenna, welcome to Veterans Radio. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Well, we're going to talk to Jenna. She is also known as the Millennial Veteran. She is active on all sorts of different uh, social media programs, uh, Facebook, she has a group, Instagram, a big group, does vet chats live on Instagram. Um, and she has, among other things, a, a monthly opinion piece in Task and Purpose. She recently wrote on the recruiting crisis, and that's uh, particularly caught my attention and said, I got to talk to Jenna and get the view of a younger vet. Now, let me set this up, if you will, Jenna, and you can correct any mistakes I make. You were a nice Wisconsin girl graduating from high school, and you thought, I should join the Navy. (laughs) Yes, yes, pretty much. Um, I had an uncle who served, and he really talked me into it, said, you know, you're going to see the world, you're going to get out of Wisconsin, and I I was sold. I was excited to uh, have a new experience. So she served four years in the United States Navy uh, from 2013 to 2017, uh, got out as a petty officer second class. You were, and I don't think I've ever spoken to anybody who was an aerographer's mate, and you deployed on the Harry S. Truman. Tell us what you did in that uh, capacity. Yes, so um, aerographer's mate is weather, meteorology, oceanography, So I was trained as an observer, a weather observer. So basically I told you what was going on now. Um, And and that's pretty important for pilots. You know, they need to know where the ceilings are at for cloud levels, what the wind speed's at. So I I did a lot of um, briefing pilots for um, on the carrier. And and, uh, that uh, part of getting out of Wisconsin was to see the world. So did you get a chance to do that? Yes, I did. Yep. On on that deployment, we went to Dubai, we went to Greece, um, we went to Croatia, and we went to Bahrain. So I definitely got to see a lot of the world, and um, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> you are you are not in Wisconsin anymore uh, at that no, point. And far from it. <laughs> I always get a kick out of folks in the Navy because generally they're folks who, who were not on the ocean's edge. You know, somebody from Iowa or Nebraska or Illinois or Wisconsin makes it to the Navy. Now, at least Wisconsin, you say, well, I had a Great Lakes. I knew what water, you know, big water was. But uh, so it was an uncle who talked you into this. Uh, You still talking to him? Yes. Oh, yes. Well, one of the other things that you were able to do after the Navy, uh, I assume, is use your GI Bill and you picked up your bachelor's degree in public policy from St. Mary's College of Maryland in in 2020. Uh, Am I correct in that? Yes. Yep. 
and as part of that, I think you got an internship at the House of Representatives, uh, which probably helped ignite your interest in public policy. Yes, it, it absolutely did. And that's where I got to um, really work with uh, a lot of the public and a lot of veterans and hear a lot of, um, you know, how, how policy is, how the sausage is made, as they say. Yeah, some of that stuff you don't want to see because it's not very pretty. <laughs> Um, uh, she, we're going to back up to her time on the carrier for in a minute, but she's currently working at uh, uh, Naval Air Systems Command as a government employee. Has been doing that for a couple of years there. Uh, do you want to explain briefly what that role is about? Yes. So uh, as you can see, the politic route did not work out. So I ended up working back for the Navy as a civilian, and I currently do contracts. Okay, well, uh, I have to back up to this story because uh, she told it to me before we got started and, and said it was okay to, to uh, bring it on the air. So uh, you, you met your future husband while you were on the uh, Truman, didn't you? Yes, I did. I, I met him in our last port, and this was in Greece. And, you know, we were all dressed up for a friend's birthday and me and one of my friends, we stepped out of the bar to get a breather and we went down to another quiet bar. And as soon as uh, uh, our friend, our, this guy walked in with us, you know, he said, I'll, I'll go um, somewhere quieter with you guys. So we walk into this other bar. He walks in with two pretty girls and this it was a British football team, uh, soccer team, and they whistled at us girls and um, my future husband, you know, he said, hey, you can't do that to them. And they just jumped on him and he got knocked out. Um, he was bleeding. And then his friends and came and took him away because um, if you served in the Navy, you know, there's such thing as shore patrol. They're like police officers that are dressed as civilians and they report on anyone misbehaving so they took him away so he wouldn't get caught <laughs> um and then i i never got his last name so i didn't see him the rest of the deployment and then about six months later we uh reunited at a going away party i saw him there and we we started dating ever since <laughs> well and there's a five-year-old daughter to, that's very thankful that you were on the truman in, in greece observing a bar fight so that, so that you could uh, connect with your future husband and uh, unfortunately uh, all too many folks who've been in the uh, navy or any, any sea service who've been away for out on ship for a long time you get into port and you maybe drink too much and uh, you, you got a lot of pent up energy so I'm, I'm i'm sure all of that was uh, part part of that evening but it all worked out didn't it it did. It, it was meant to be, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've taken those experiences from your Navy time and your time on the house and and thought about how veterans of your generation are, are being treated or not treated, uh, heard or not heard. And it really has uh, launched you into this passion of being a veteran advocate uh, as i say the millennial veteran is the name that you use on a lot of these sites um, talk to us about how that evolved and how it brings you to where you are today yes yeah, so um like i mentioned i did my internship and then when I got when I got out, um, I joined the local legion, and I realized that I was the youngest one by about twenty years. Uh, me and my husband, and so when we'd come in, they would call us the millennial veterans. Oh, the young people are here. Um, so it just got me wondering, where are all the younger veterans? I live in a I live near a base, so I figured there would be more out and about or wanting to be a part of something like the legion. Um, and then as the pandemic hit, I started reaching out online to other people that have gotten out and just trying to share advice on benefits or schooling. Um, but so, yeah, that's kind of how I started my online thing, trying to get younger veterans involved because I realized a lot of them um, don't realize they have a whole community and they have benefits that they can turn to. A lot of veterans like to isolate themselves. It's very easy to feel you're the only one in this. Nobody else is going through what I'm going through. And nothing could be further from the truth. And and part of that is 
About 30% of veterans have some sort of disability rating from VA, which means a big group of of veterans, 70% or so, don't have those situations arise in in their life. But it's real easy if you're in that 30% group or otherwise struggling in transition to think, well, I'm the only one who's never had a job or I'm the only one who hates the job that I've gotten. And as you've talked to you know, literally thousands uh, and interacted with thousands of younger veterans. What are some of the themes that you hear? Yes. Yeah. I I hear a lot about isolation. Um, I hear a lot of people who delay getting help. Um, And, and, you know, I think every generation, all generations, we have the same, we have the same problems since war has started really coming back, reentering into society, having, um, injuries either physical or mental um but i think what change changes per generation is how you want to seek care what 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 do you want to remedy all these old age problems and i think a lot of younger veterans are more open to mental health and right now the va just doesn't have that mental health care that matches the demand in the community um, so that's something I've seen that's been kind of a, a bigger problem with younger veterans. One of the also differences between, uh, you know, uh, the Vietnam era where I am uh, fit myself into uh, and today's veterans is the increase in women who have served in the uh, military and then become veterans. Any Any additional themes that you've heard from that cohort? Yes, that's a great point, um, because the veteran community is becoming more female, and we need the VA to also reflect that. But, but yes, in that, and we need to make sure women feel comfortable in these spaces, and just having more women involved will, will help change that. Yeah, we, we now have uh, more women in leadership positions, secretaries of state, uh, commanders of their uh, of the services, that sort of thing. So it really is hopefully changing and, and clearly for the better. As, as you've talked in, to folks and thought about these issues, it, it kind of led you to write this opinion piece on all of the services are missing their recruiting goals, and you can't keep doing that and have national security. So, Jenna, I guess I wanted to get your views on the recruiting problem that uh, the military faces and, you know, what kind of compelled you to write the opinion piece that you did on this issue from the point of a younger veteran. Yes. So um, I went out to the military influencer conference and they had a panel, which I attended, and it was um the VA press secretary, there's a lot of big names up there, um, the president of MOA, um, and they were talking about, you know, how veterans should share their stories and, and be involved in helping the recruiting crisis, um, which, you know, it's it's a great sentiment, and I wish it was that easy, but I, I couldn't help but thinking about um, sometimes the hardest part of serving is the aftermath and the lifelong injuries that are veterans are living with and and sometimes that's the um you know the most painful part is uh continuing your life after service with these life altering injuries and not being helped uh which you were promised to be helped through the VA um and so I I kind of took that the opinions of when I worked in Congress and I would get folks of the Vietnam era calling in um you know, needing help but not qualifying uh, due to different parameters. Um, And then also the messages that I get daily from people who have um, served, especially women who have had MST and um, just all those opinions were swirling in my head. And I was like, I got to say something, you know, I, I think a lot of us would love to advocate about the great experiences, but also we can't just ignore the pain that it's caused so that's really where i was writing from and and you see this reflected in studies done by the rand corporation or uh, iava just came out with a a survey of women warriors this summer and i got a chance to talk to um allison jaslow their president uh, uh, and ceo over that you still have uh, 50 or 70 percent depending on the on the stats 
of people recommending that you know would they would you recommend to your family members friends that uh, they consider joining the military and i'm kind of surprised by that number sometimes because it's not for everybody um, mm-hmm. and particularly we you know just coming out of a 20 year war hopefully we're not going back into anything uh, it's a different type of service if you're not in in a war but so many people don't serve at the you know at the front line um you know everybody's got these different experiences and and i suppose I, i'm interested if if you think overall younger veterans would be much lower than 50 percent approval of uh, or recommendation of going into the military oh yeah i i would be curious to know that as well um especially for you know younger veterans are having um, less deployments they're not going to have that combat experience as other generations but still i think the most harmful thing is is what i hear the most is just the culture of the military um and i've had people reach out to me that have served of all eras and say yes you know i've i've seen such a shift in just how military leadership is and i think that's one of the biggest pain points um is just that disconnect between leadership and um you know creating a culture of um you know, being able to reach out for help or just better communication all around. Yeah, it, the military is a big organization. And if you work for any big organization, uh, communications from the top down uh, is always a challenge and seems like it all always gets changed as it keeps working its way down. But one of the things you said in your opinion piece was that you felt uh, many of the younger veterans were given unrealistic expectations of what our military service would be like. Are you referring to what the recruiter told you or uh, the image that's, you know, your uncle or Hollywood or, or something else put in your head is about how this would be in the Navy? I'm referring to all of it. Um, just how society portrays service. Um, even even recruiters, of course, you know, they're going to tell you anything to get you to sign. Yeah, you can't believe um, a thing they tell you. That's what I tell everybody who asks. <laughs> Take whatever right. the recruiter says with a grain of salt. Oh, absolutely. And, and definitely Hollywood. You know, they put this image. Um, you're doing a heroic thing. You're going to be changing the world. Um, you know, when I joined the Navy slogan, what they were pushing was a global fight for good. So I really thought that I was out there, um, you know, maintaining that. And I think a, a lot of us are kind of fed that image. And then when you join, you realize, OK, um, you know, maybe America's not the shining hero that I, I thought it was. You know, I, I witnessed a lot of terrible things the military accidentally did to other countries and and you know you're just putting things in perspective in that way which is you know it's kind of hard to um, come to terms with some of this is the difference between being 19 year olds and being late 20s right i mean don't you is, is hasn't your world view just evolved Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, I think that that's very true. And most of us, we join at 18, 19, you're joining at that age. And so, um, you know, once, once you get in there and you, you see it for what it is, it's, it's um, something you gotta, you gotta deal with. I call it, everyone has mixed feelings about um, their service in that way. One of the other things you write about, and, and I think this, I, I'm curious as to a younger veteran's view on the transition out of service. You know, back back in the day, there was no, the word transition didn't exist. You were in and one day out the next. Um, hopefully you could find some civvies to wear. Um, but there seems to be a bigger emphasis on recognizing that there does need to be a transition out. But as you point out, the first year out is when the risk of suicide is highest, are we doing enough in transition uh, and getting people ready for it, uh, for that big change in lifestyle? I think we're doing 
great in, you know, there's a lot of career avenues because, you know, you're not going to get out and it's really hard to meet that same paycheck. I think they're pretty practical on that. But when it comes to the identity piece or how you're going to fit into society, I think we're, we're sugarcoating that a little bit. Um, and I can just tell by some of the, I do a lot of short little clips on Instagram and I have people reaching out to me all the time saying, I thought I was the only, I thought I was the, the weirdo. I thought I was, you know, so alone. I thought there was something wrong with me um, on why I didn't fit in or why I couldn't get myself together after the military. Um, so I think we just need to be more honest and understand that yes being tough and being mission oriented and all those things that helped us in the military aren't necessarily going to help us in the civilian world and we just need to start having more conversations like that yeah you use the word identity which i think's pretty interesting because you have a certain identity when you're in uniform, right? And when you come mm-hmm. home and you see your friends and they know what you're doing, you have this identity exists and maybe it's blown up a little bit, but it exists. When you get out, you no longer have that identity. Uh, a word I like to use is purpose. You have to have a purpose too in life. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, it's, it, you do sit on the couch, wallow and think about, uh, you know, things like harming yourself, which you shouldn't do. Is is that a little bit of what we're not helping veterans with enough is to have them realize it's going to take some time to have a new identity, to find a new purpose, to find the right job? We all think this is going to happen immediately, don't we? Right, right. Yes, that that's so important because so much of our identity in the military, you know, society puts us kind of on a pedestal like they're out there they're fighting for us you know you're doing something good with your job and then you get out and you like I went from you know being in the navy to being a college kid and they're one of the most um you know looked at as like entitled people um you know so it was just hard to go from uh military personnel to college or you know some people are getting out and having to take a lower paying job and and you, it's just, it kind of messes with you. It's like, what's my purpose? You know, what what's my next mission looking like now? And I just think we could be more um, honest about how that's going to affect us because I don't know anyone who hasn't experienced that. This is, uh, you know, just Jim's ex- uh, experience from years of talking to folks about this transition issue and... and uh, Look, at I hear her. How good is that? And, <laughs> and, my, and my, my two-year-old just came <laughs> home too. I'm sorry. Not a problem. And my thought, my thought is that we we're not honest with folks, or we we don't pass on what we've learned. And it it takes about honestly six years after you get out to go through. Maybe it's some more college or education. Maybe it's two or three lousy jobs before you figure out the one you really like. It doesn't happen in the first year or second year or third year. It may take six years before you go, man, I really feel solid now. Have you experienced that at all? Have you heard from folks who said, yeah, those first couple of years were horrible, but I really feel like I'm grounded now? Yes, yes. And I get that question a lot. Uh, People are like, how long does it take? They want to know how how long does it take for you to go through this transition phase? And I'm like, it's different for everyone. Absolutely. I think six years is a good number, more realistic than uh, what people plan on, like six month adjustment period. I think we need to give um, ourselves more time and a lot more understanding. You know, it it is a process and it's not going to be an overnight thing. And, And not only do we have to give it, we veterans have to give that timeline in ourselves more patience and more allowance for the time to go by but we also have to communicate that to our family because whether it's mom or dad or uncle or a spouse they're all thinking like man this what's taking so long and the reality of it is it just takes a long time and it, it is different for everybody and i i'm just picking the number that i kind of have played with with folks in the past to to get there and i think both the veteran and his or her circle of friends and family have to understand that. And, and I don't think they do. Do you? 
No, no, and it, it's something you're right. I think we need to remind um, military personnel as they're getting out to identify that support system and you know, say those phrases like, hey, I'm going to be different. You know, I'm not the person who who left for the military. You know, I was 18 at that time and now I'm coming back. I'm not going to be the same person. I think a lot of families get frustrated with that or even, um, you know, they're, they're not used to them being around as much. So it can create issues. But, but yeah, they'll never fully understand, um, but they can have – they can have more compassion for you during that time. So yeah, that's great that, to communicate. Yeah, that's what you're looking for is just a little more compassion from the, those folks who, who want to be helpful, but they just sometimes don't know how and don't really realize <clears throat> how long it's going to take uh, because you've got a lot of stuff to sort out, uh, um, finding your new identity, finding your new purpose. So as we wrap up, uh, we're talking to Jenna Carlton. She is the Millennial Veteran on Facebook and Instagram. Jenna, talk, uh, give, us, give our veteran radio listeners some idea of uh, how they can follow along on what you're doing. Yes, so I'm most active over on Instagram. Um, and I also, um, we also have a weekly podcast that comes out Sundays at 9 is when we're live on Instagram. And then I usually have it posted uh, Monday morning on the podcast. Um, I also have a workbook that I self-published uh, for veterans to kind of work through a lot of the things we just talked about, um, finding community, that purpose after service, um, you know, diving into your new identity and really setting yourself up for the next chapter the best way you can. And uh, you could find the link to that also on my Instagram well, it's, I'm also on LinkedIn, but I'm not as um, consistent over there. And, and you have a Facebook, uh, the Millennial Veteran has a Facebook uh, site as well that seems fairly active. Yep, we have a Facebook group and we have a lot of chats in there. People are always online, um, which is good because, you know, um, I encourage people to reach out. If you're feeling isolated or lonely, someone's always going to be active on there and be able to talk to you. Well, we appreciate uh, everything that you're doing for our veterans. Uh, certainly uh, a nice Wisconsin girl went to the Navy, found a husband in Greece, and now has two chatty daughters. That's great. And, uh, <laughs> and we're, uh, we're, gl- we're glad for all that you're doing out there and spending a little time with Veterans Radio today. Thank you so much for having me on, Jim. It's been such a pleasure. And I want to thank everybody for listening to Veterans Radio today. I am Jim Fossone. It's been a pleasure to be your host. I'm a veterans disability lawyer at Legal Help for Veterans, and you can reach us at 800-693-4800 or legalhelpforveterans.com on the web. You can follow Veterans Radio on Facebook and listen to its podcasts and Internet radio shows by visiting us at veteransradio.org. That's veteransradio.org. And until next time, you are dismissed. If you have a VA claim denied by the Board of Veterans' Appeals, contact Legal Help for Veterans at 1-800-693-4800. They're experts in handling cases before the U.S. Court of Appeals for Veterans' Claims. Their number again, 1-800-693-4800. We again want to thank our national sponsors, the National Veterans Business Development Council, nvbdc.org, VA Ann Arbor Health Care System, the Vietnam Veterans of America, Charles S. Kettles Chapter, Ann Arbor, Michigan, VFW Graf O'Hara Post 423 in Ann Arbor, and the American Legion Press Corn Post 46, also in Ann Arbor. We appreciate all your support. You can go to veteransradio.net, click on the sponsor level, and continue to support keeping Veterans Radio on the air. And until next time, you are dismissed. With the Lucky Land Slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. This is your captain speaking. Uh, we've got clear runway and the weather's fine, but we're just going to circle up here a while and uh, get lucky. No, no, nothing like that. It's just these cash prizes add up quick. So I suggest you sit back, keep your tray table upright, and start getting lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandsLots.com. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details.